Hello, and welcome back to Careers Behind the Code. I'm with Amanda Silver today. Hi. Let's get started. <laughs> Okay, so I'm here with Amanda Silver. Amanda, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your role is here? Uh, I am the director of PM for the Visual Studio family of products. All right, so tell us a little bit more about this. So when you say the Visual <laughs> Studio family, like what, what does that mean? Uh, Visual Studio on Windows, okay. that, ex that user experience, Visual Studio for the Mac, um, and Visual Studio Code. And then there's a bunch of other, other projects that kind of just, just roll in there, like uh, tooling for Windows development or uh, the TypeScript programming language, oh, cool. stuff like that. All right, so I'm excited about this episode because you are our first uh, program manager victim. Yes. And so we, we've kind of <laughs> done like architect with, with Fowler. We did yeah. uh, like Miguel is sort of like our entrepreneurial sort of multidiscipline leader, but you, you are our PM exemplar to start. Sure. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about like the things that you've done across your career. So mm -hmm. right now, like, and I guess we should probably state that indeed your, your, that role is we're starting today in some ways, right? But you've, you're coming well, yeah. from a, 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 a sort of long line of, of roles around Visual Studio, right? Is that right? Right. I mean, I've worked in developer division at Microsoft since 2001, and you so, win. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been a while. Yeah. And in that time, I've worked on basically every. Uh, I've worked on the tooling for basically every platform at Microsoft, from you know SQL to Xbox to um, Office to Azure. Uh, to Windows, um, in, as, as well Xamarin and, and iOS. So really everything. If, if, if it's a programming <laughs> language and you could do it in Visual Studio, you probably had your hands on design. Yeah, or just point. a platform, uh, yeah. even if it's not necessarily about a particular programming language, yeah. Got it. So like in the sense of like with like TypeScript or VB in that sense? Or? Oh, no, no, no. So I mean, well, it depends sure. on, on <laughs> what you want to talk about. In, in terms of you know my career, I kind of started uh, when I started at Microsoft in the runtime and programming languages. So my first job was to kind of focus on com interop and you know how do you do p invokes uh, way back in the day. That was like the first you know wow. six months of my job here, maybe less. And, um, and there's someone today working on p invokes <laughs> and, from VB. That's right, yeah. Oh my gosh. And, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then after a while, I kind of started to do just more of the programming language for v Visual Basic .NET. And then from there, it kind of uh, continued to uh, snowball into more and more things. So you know, I did more programming language, and then I did more the the overall you know development experience with the editor and the debugger. And then I was kind of like in charge of the entire Visual Basic .NET experience. And then after that, then I started to work on uh, uh, Office development and cool. the Office extensibility platform and. And it just kind of many, many different Got dimensions. So, so you've taken a like, broad generalist sort of thing. You, you've done deep in certain verticals, and then you've kind of gone and take broad yeah, thing across I've, platforms I've, as well. Yeah, I've as. done deep in, in, in programming languages, in API design, in um, uh, code editing experiences, and debugging, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but then I've also done platform generalist stuff uh, uh, with respect to the various platforms that we enable. And, and in, in recent years, I think you, you, a lot of your focus has been more on cultural stuff, like trying to drive culture through the Yeah, through, I mean, you know, team. I think that's one, you know, you talked about how I'm the first PM victim that you have <laughs> on this show. Like, uh, you know, in a way, it's kind of like, well, what is the PM role about? Yeah. And to me, um, I think about my job as half anthropology. <laughs> because I'm basically studying developers and kind of how they use tools uh -huh. um, and how they use tools efficiently and how they use tools inefficiently and you know what motivates them to do things and and half craftsmanship because I'm constantly studying kind of how they do it and mm -hmm. then trying to figure out how do we refine that and so I think a lot of what I've I've done in in any one of these roles is that I've always tried to bring the the customer's perspective to the conversation. I, I love the anthropology <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Yeah, and um, and so like you know, while there might be other folks in the room who are literally typing the code that that does the thing that we agree should should work, uh, I'm the person who kind of and my team are the people who 
who go and find the use cases and say whether or not this will actually work for a real life customer that's out there or not. Great. And, and let's let's talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you bring customer into the team, right? Like, how do you, how do you like kind of lead that? Yeah. Well, I mean, first um, we start everything that we might do uh, with open-ended customer inquiry. So basically, we we figure out, okay, well, who might be a target customer that we would want to talk to or a target mm -hmm. user, because uh, not all of them are paying customers per se, um, that might be using this thing that we're thinking about in the future. And, and when we start with that inquiry, we don't even know necessarily what we're actually going to build. Uh, we might start a conversation with someone about, hey, just what's the hardest thing mm -hmm. that you have to deal with as a development manager in an enterprise or as a data scientist in, um, in an academic research lab? Um, and we kind of, f the, what, the reason I call it customer-led inquiry is yeah. because we go where the customer leads us. Um, so if, for example, they say, hey, look, you know, collaboration on my team is the biggest pain point, right? It's really hard. Um, then we'll go and dig on that until we figure out, okay, well, this is the very specific articulation of the problem that they're actually encountering. And here are a couple of different solutions that we could maybe explore to address that problem. Got it. All right. So let's start breaking down <laughs> how you got to where you are. Okay. okay. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, so right now you're 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 the director of PM. So that means you're like kind of a manager of managers of managers of in of, some cases, of, yeah. of program uh, managers. So you're you, a you're you're a manager. B your discipline is sort of like you focus on program management, and yep. you've done that throughout your career. You've, yeah, you've always correct. been a, a yeah. program manager. Yeah. So um, talk. To, let's let's walk backwards and let's okay. try to figure out like From where the beginning. The, well, no. <laughs> let's go from the end towards okay. the beginning. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. And 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 let's let's see. Like, what what do you feel like was the last place where you had like a major place where you had to make either a decision or where a big change came into your thing? And we'll leave today out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last change. I think that that about three or four years ago, mm -hmm. we started on a customer-led inquiry journey, uh -huh. and that actually led to a stream of work that's going to occupy us for the next, you know, five or six years. By which you mean like like an <laughs> effort that you that you like sort of was do you think of this as like an opportunity to kind of jump in and learn a new field? Yeah, I mean it, it a in a way it was kind of exploring like what's the white space opportunity uh, for development teams. And, and so it was less like a, a new position than like it was less a new position, right? Because at that time I was really just doing um, uh, you know, the Visual Studio Core product, I was doing Windows tooling, and, um, and it wasn't as much about, like, you know, we're coming out with this next major version, yeah. what's going to be in the next major version, it was more about what problems are our customers having that we could potentially solve. So did and you so see it as like... I, I, didn't, I didn't really see it as a pivot at the time. Um, uh, it kind of just felt like a, oh, let's go figure out, you know, what's being underserved. And, and what, what triggered that, the, the change, right? Like, is it like you noticed something that was changing inside the company? Is it like we got this sort of overall? I think there were a couple of things. I mean, w you know, there's always business a a dimensions sure. of this, right? And so if we think about the, the, um, the develop, the, the market mm -hmm. specifically for paid developer tools, mm -hmm. um, it's actually been declining uh, over the past few years, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, you know, number one is with the rise of the cloud platforms, a lot of tools are being um, uh, what's the word? Commoditized. Not commoditized. Um, uh, there's subsidies uh, okay. by the cloud providers to basically incent users to Felt to like yeah, well, to use their clouds. Yeah, essentially. Um, and so that's an aspect of it, but also there are dimensions of commoditization where, you know, look, like the experience for doing code editing has been known for, you know, 20, 25 years. Um, and, and, you know, there's a point at which you're, it, there's a question around like, well, what really is there yeah. to differentiate on? And so that's part of what kind of led to this conversation. It's like, well, what are our opportunities for product differentiation? What, how does the cloud kind of change the, 
the nature of what uh, developers need to do. Um, and then also, you know, just thinking about if there's a shrinking market for developer tools, how do we think about, first of all, our share of that, that market? Got it. And then secondly, like, are there opportunities in adjacent markets to kind of think about how our I product see. line could grow? So it's really, in some ways, you think that it was like the business, like, uh, d was really the lead for what you saw as an opportunity to change the way you did your job? Uh, like by the evolving marketplace of where our tools. Well, sit. it's interesting that you say that because now that you're saying that, <laughs> I'm like, no, actually the pivot started even earlier, which is um, uh, when we started to look at mobile during the mobile pivot. Um, 2000 and... Two, I guess this was 2012, 2013. Got it. Um, uh, that's when we had just released some, we had been partnering with Xamarin mm -hmm. as an external company, uh, and we had released some tools for Visual Studio Cordova. Um, and I think while they were good tools and they were starting to get adoption, and actually we still see yeah. pretty decent traction on both, uh, there was just a question around, we had just done the V1. How do we know we did the right V1? Uh, and what would be the appropriate V2. And so at that time, there was a kind of a general movement at Microsoft to become more uh, customer focused. And so what we did is we actually brought the mobile team through a boot camp of sorts to kind of reboot the culture. Got it. And, uh, and so what, what happened in that is um, we basically started with uh, customer interviews. We did probably 400 customer interviews that were at least a half hour long in a six week period. Got it. And just with mobile developers, both our customers and those who were not our customers at the time. And, and doing this process is sort of like what gives the seed of the sort of like more broad scaled set of changes that come later? Is yeah. That, like well, you kind of learn from going well, yeah. that process? I mean, it, this was actually something that we did not just with the PM team, mm -hmm. but we actually did with the engineering team as well as the doc team. We even brought the legal team and the marketing team with us <laughs> through this journey because we really wanted everybody who was focused on how could we be, create better mo mobile tooling to really understand the customer that we were trying to target. And is it, is yeah. it fair to say that like sort of by like getting into the sort of like customer obsession thing at the point where our culture of a company was shifting that that effectively sets you up well for like being seen as somebody you could lead in this space and therefore like sort of changes after that point were what do you mean? Like in the sense of <laughs> like, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to think about this in the, in the context of how, uh, again, sort of career yeah, focus, right? Yeah. And, and so um, you were there at the point where there was this insight that you started to see about like what the value of this was. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to understand if you feel like that was an accelerator in terms of. I definitely do feel like that was an yeah. accelerator. I think that uh, the thing, you know, you, um, how do I put it? So, so there is, um, I, I don't believe that, uh, that I can be super effective by having a kind of directorial, like, go do this approach mm -hmm. to my job. I think what my, part of my job is to basically empower my teams to be as smart as they possibly can be and to get smarter over time. And so, what I found, the reason that this is an accelerator is not because I was like, you know, mm -hmm. captain of the team or something like that at the time, but because it actually got me to think a little bit differently as a manager about more how do I actually empower my teams to, to get smart uh, and to basically continually improve um, our understanding of the customer that we're trying to target. And, and in some ways, like, the way you made them more smart is by like kind of bringing the voice of the customer, customer into the and actually facilitating this process. And over the past few years, we've we've uh, really operationalized this approach um, to the point where you know basically any investment that we're thinking about doing starts with customer-led inquiry, um, and uh, and we continually refine it. Uh, you know, you almost think, might think about it as uh, reducing the risk of what we're investing in. Um, it's similar to lean methodologies sure. and other things that a lot of folks in the Valley talk about, uh, but maybe not 
not might not be have uh, as much adoption inside of Microsoft. It's a little bit of a different way uh, to approach product development. That's awesome. All right, so now let's start moving backwards. <laughs> okay. So we've got this thing where it's like you're 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 able to sort of bring this information in that sort of accelerates your whole team. So yeah. you're able to make these things. I right. want to move backwards from there. Sure. Okay. And that uh, like as we're getting closer and closer, yeah. like what. Like an early career person could take. <laughs> yeah. Take well, I mean, so for before that, mm -hmm. I had the the biggest pivot before that was um, that I w started working on Chakra, mm -hmm. uh, which was the JavaScript That's engine that powered um, powered Edge and powers Edge uh, before this latest kind of strategy sh switch a little bit. Um, and with that, that's also the time period when we started working on TypeScript. Got it. Um, and the reason that I started to work on those things was really a pretty dramatic pivot, um, which is that the I had been working on the Office tooling and the and the um, extensibility story for Office, and we had this fantastic pitch to the Office team about how we could improve it. And basically, we got some news that it was not going to make the product, um, that they had cut it from that version. The, the of office team. The office team had cut it from that version of what we were planning to do for that particular era. And so the project that I thought I was working on, which was going to be this massive thing, ended up being a much smaller thing. And so my boss at the time said to me, look, you know, I don't think this is a job that, that is worthy of your scope anymore. And um, and so essentially saying like go figure something else out, and you well, know that's interesting. That like almost like g gave the um, opportunity to you to go think about what what you wanted to do next. It was a little less like yeah, here's this I mean, new thing. You know, there, it was never like a, a um, you don't have a job anymore. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> but it was more like a look. This just isn't as big of an opportunity as we were we were hoping or expecting it to be. And so, so. let's go figure out something that's appropriate. Um, and so it just so happened that that very same day, I happened to be having lunch with my um, my mentor okay. at the time, uh, who's Shanku Niyogi, who is okay. now the VP of product for GitHub. Um, and it just so happened that that very same day, his uh, his GPM for Chakra had left for a competing company. Oh my. And uh, and so uh, so. You know, Shanka was like, hey, does this sound like something that would interest you? And I was like, all right, sure, let's <laughs> try that. So I did. And, so and here is the, the uh, serendipity <laughs> comes to play. This I thing. think serendipity has played a massive role in my career for sure. I, ironically, in, as I'm learning from these conversations, like as I, I start, I'm starting to have done enough that I can start to see some patterns. It's yeah. funny how often the answer is, well, there was this reorg. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. Then, I mean, and I and think it's not like the reorg makes it good. It's just that the reorg kind of releases some sort of energy that allows the person to find right. the kind of opportunity that would develop them to the next level. For sure. And in this case, it was not a reorg per se. It was just that yeah. there was a canceling of one project and basically Direction a departure of another thing. one. And so for me, even though the team didn't really change, for me individually, that was a, a big pivot. Got it. Because I had been a .NET person before that, and all of a sudden I'm in the JavaScript world, and I didn't really know a ton about JavaScript at that time. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, what did you, and so at that point, did you feel like, was that the first time when you felt like you'd made a major like shift for, away from, we talked about how you had that sort of like, uh, VB.NET was sort of your, your the place where you had specialization is that's the point where you made the decision to be more of a generalist based on the no, opportunity, or did you feel no, like no? That done was that? that was actually a little bit earlier. Okay. Yeah. So so I think this was two thousand nine that I'm talking about now when I started to mm -hmm. make the trip the pivot from uh, focusing on on kind of dot, well I was really on office programmability before that, uh, and then I started to focus on on JavaScript specifically. Um, JavaScript did play a, a role in the pitch that we were making to the office team, uh, but it wasn't. It didn't it's require. Like a link, but it not didn't like require critical. me to go like super deep on on these are the intricacies of JavaScript and and you know all of the dimensions of like of how the community is really different than the .NET community that I was familiar with. How the programming language was obviously different. How um, there are all these runtime requirements and kind of the role that the runtime played in the operating system. Um, so there were a lot cool. of dimensions that were really different. Got it. All yeah. Right. Let's keep going. <laughs> keep going backwards in time? Let's keep going. Okay. Yeah. So before that, uh, 
there was um, a, a transition period where there was a reorg. Okay. That was yay. <laughs> yeah, get to the reorg. Get like, time. A, get like yeah. a buzzer that goes off. There was time. a reorg, and um, and I basically this was in the era when uh, I had been working on VisualBasic.net for I think seven years at that point, and uh, there was a decision to basically rather than have VisualBasic.net have one strategy and C Sharp have another strategy, there was kind of a decision that, hey, they actually are all about .NET and we should yeah. move them both uh, together. And, and so with that, it, it kind of meant, you know, look, like Anderson Mads are fantastic at what they do. You know, uh, I don't necessarily need to be involved in that, uh, in kind of, you know, driving the direction of, of .NET per se, mm -hmm. or of the programming language aspects of .NET. Um, and so, uh, so I decided at that time that I wanted to do something a little bit different. And so I, I decided to move to think about Office and, and Office tooling. I see. So it, it, this is, is this the one where you would say it's like you, you, you shifted away from what you're, you had sort of started on to, to being able to? Yeah. I mean, before that, I was definitely a programming language and editing experience kind of um, and, and API design kind of. Um, that was really my focus. It was much more on, on, um, on like programming rather than thinking about platforms. Got it. So I at this point, is it, is it the, like, did you, did you say like, I want to like uh, broaden the generality of what I do? Was it more like, I want to grow my scope and like, what, what was driving how you thought about what you wanted to do next, right? Um, let's see. I mean, this was like at least 10 years ago. So it's like hard it, to kind of One way to back. think about yeah. this is like, let's imagine there's someone there, you know, out there yeah. in the ether yeah, watching this who's phase. like, looking to make, you know, they, they, they feel like they've achieved some level of depth. And I feel like one of the things in, in all of these stories that you've told is there's this point where you feel like you've kind of accomplished what you set out to do in that space. In some cases, I mean, what's ironic about, about the office story, for example, is um, I think we still have a massive opportunity <laughs> to basically uh, improve, improve that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think th I think we're finally coming around to the, the chapter where maybe that'll actually happen. Um, so, so, uh, so I guess to your question, um, how did I think about it? I think one of, one of the things that has fueled my entire mm -hmm. career is um, I'm very motivated by developers generally, okay. right? And um, I actually had a recent conversation with Kevin Scott, who's our CTO, about kind of what, what drives him, right? right? Because he's, he's um, obviously like rich beyond. <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't need to pay the bills, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's just not a concern. And so I was, like, I was like, well, why are you still doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And his, his worldview is that there's kind of a dystopian world in tech and a, and a potential utopian future for tech. And, and what he would like to see is that Microsoft plays a role in, the, in ensuring that we move towards the utopian future. Um, and, and we ended up having a really good conversation about that. And you know, I think that helped crystallize kind of what, how I think about my sure. mi personal mission, which is um, I think that, that developers are at the center of any technological direction. Um, and that to really ensure that we are uh, creating a, a world that serves a vast majority of humanity and elevates humanity, sure. we actually need to have more uh, diverse set of developers in the world. And, and so through kind of like expanding your, your scope sort of generally in the, in the universe of developer tools that allowed you along that mission, is that the right connection to make or? Yeah, I mean, you know, I ended up, uh, I've, I've always been basically excited about getting up every morning and just working on how I can make developers more productive and better able to express uh, what they're trying to achieve. Right, and so if I am a vehicle for the p un untapped power of sure. all the developers in the world, um, then I think that's a pretty great mission because you know if you think about the how magnified that is, right, mm -hmm. uh, and 
and the just the magnitude of like how uh, sorry amplified that is uh, in all the developers that we're yeah. able to reach if, from the Microsoft tools like that's a pretty massive um, force and it, it always amazes me that like as far as we know I think that we, our number is like there's 15 to 18 million professional developers 24 Tw 24, 24. Is our, our number now They're yeah growing. yeah <laughs> uh, that and yeah. why you say that number of people go oh that's it's small like that's yeah. tiny yeah it yeah. is tiny yeah but in and terms of the world standards, in terms of what right? you're saying about amplification it's like right you right can touch but that's pro couple. devs right yeah. and if you think about non pro devs or citizen devs or part-time devs it's probably more in the 50 million to 70 million range right and mm -hmm. so that's a lot bigger but but then but don't think about it in those terms mm -hmm. per se think about it in terms of the the software that they build right. and who that reaches exactly right? it's like this uh, this is the idea of that there's a lever right yeah. like effectively you've got you've got that you found the way that like through um, affecting their tools you can make them more effective which then makes them their, exactly. their customers more effective which makes their customers right more effective, right which, right yeah, right so wheel. so in that way like I think the the thing that has always driven me in my career aspirations has been not so much like you know I want to achieve some particular title or or something like that, but more just like how could I, how could I be more effective mm -hmm. in the mission that I'm trying to pursue, which is to to um, make individual developers and more and their teams more productive, and to bring a more diverse group of developers into into you know the community. All right, let's jump forward just a bit, and then I'll we'll wrap up. Jump with back, oh, but even <laughs> yeah. further back. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Timeline yeah, problems yeah, yeah. are, are yeah. huge. This is time travel is going to yeah. be our, 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 late, <laughs> our late twist. In the is there going to be like a graphic? At the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you are here. Uh, <laughs> anyways, how would you get into this? How, like, so we, we've sort of established mission, yeah. and we've yeah. sort of uh, this idea that like you have that drive. Yeah. That's what helps you make these sort of decisions across all of them, right? It's yep. the pattern across. Yep. So how did you get on this in the first place? Like, how did you end up finding that? Did you know at the point where you're no, you know, picking again, a job? No, it was, it was that, totally or? serendipity, right? Um, I mean, I always knew I was a nerd. I came from <laughs> a nerd family. My dad's a physicist, and and um, my brothers ended up going into tech and and you know nanotechnology and stuff like that. Wow. And um, and so I kind of knew like I that I wanted to do math and science as when I was in high school. You got that with the morning cereal came in. Yeah, you I about mean, physics. And yeah, <laughs> I mean, like, if, if, when we were kids, if we wanted to end our parents' dinner parties, we would make my dad talk about string theory. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And it turned out like the kids were fascinated, but my dad, uh, my my dad's friends would leave. So even though many of them were physicists, <laughs> that's an excellent exploit. <laughs> when did you learn to be so manipulative? <laughs> no, it's great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think from there, then I decided to like you know <laughs> go to a particular university because hey, they seem to have good you know STEM. Um, and uh, and then I kind of accidentally ended up in the compu computer science 101 course because everybody said it was really great. Got it. And uh, and it turned out it was a lot of fun and there was you know a bit of a kind of campy culture around the um, TAs that that facilitated it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I kind of got into this community of I see of CS. And then, um, so feel like almost like finding your community in some ways, like it's this, you found this group of uh, yes that and was no. I mean, I always thing. felt like an outsider for sure, uh -huh. uh, and there were definitely elements of like you know trying of of, of very trying times that uh -huh. that um, it was a good question over whether or not I should continue in it. But but by the time I I graduated. Uh, I had become a TA to a couple of different classes, and so I always, I always felt there was kind of this weird attitude in computer science about how elitist it should be. Mm -hmm. That like you know there should only be everybody should be a systems programmer, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, and really the only true developers are systems programmers. And and I always thought that was kind of silly, mm -hmm. um, because you know. Just there's such a massive opportunity in terms of the power of technology, and we actually need developers in many, many different levels of the stack. Yeah. 
And so the more developers that we could bring into the market, the better, the better for business, um, the better for the end users mm -hmm. and their experience, uh, and really the better for humanity if you think that, that technology is impacting humanity at large. And is, is that sort of like why you picked uh, program, like you started at program management at this No, period, that was totally, I mean, I did start in program management. The reason I ended up in program management was entirely, uh, almost random. I mean, at that time, the, usual, we go to the way, yeah, the Microsoft box. would give you like a little form. Yeah. Uh, and, and I didn't even think I was going to end up at Microsoft. Um, but they gave you a little form and there were three options with like a sentence each of, you know, this is what you do if you're a developer, this is what you do if you're a yes. PM, this is what you do if you're a tester. And I was like, all right, PM sounds good. So check. And that's what I did. And so I ended up, you know, interviewing for a PM job. So, so it really wasn't well that was thought a really out because I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't really understand the yeah. the specifics of of what the role meant. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, did did you like immediately know that it was for you once you got here and started to get more of a no, sense? No, I mean or? for for a while w when I came to Microsoft, I didn't intend to be a lifer at Microsoft. In some ways, you know, I'm 18 years in now, so so some people might call me a lifer. Um, I'm almost 18 years in. Uh, um, I intended to quit after two years. Okay. Because um, I thought I was going to be an academic because, you know, my dad was like a lab scientist, yeah. right? And that was kind of what I conceived of as a job, right? That is what you do. Like you your visualization of what yeah, what being a grown up is right. Like, exactly, like yeah, you you does, put yeah. in your time on on some you know basic research and hope that eventually it turns into something that uh, is useful, and um, and that's you know that's what your job is, right? And so I thought I was going to when I graduated, I thought I was going to go into like bioinformatics and um, kind of the intersection between biology and computer science. Wow, and very different. Than yeah, it country. is, right. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought when I was graduating, I thought, well, being a PhD is a long slog. It's like six years. Yes. And, and <laughs> you can end up being kind of, um, you know, poor during that. You don't get paid a ton at yeah. most places. And so I was like, well, you know, all of my undergraduate internships were um, scientific. They were all at labs or research facilities or other things the, like that. Towards the more towards the path that you, you more thought towards you would the take. academic yeah. side. And and I thought, well, maybe I should try industry a little bit just so that I can rule that out. Plus, it would be a good way for me to earn a little bit of money to basically fund my lifestyle through graduate school. Ha ha. And, uh, and so I went to the technical career fair with 10 resumes in hand, and I thought I would hand it out to the 10 companies, that, or to the companies that would pay me the most in cash. <laughs> I was not interested in stocks at the time because this, was, this was 2000, and <laughs> it was right at the, at the <laughs> end crash. of the first uh, dot-com bubble burst. And so I didn't hand it out to Google because they were a startup at the time. And I was like, well, they're going to go under. Like, I don't, <laughs> like don't want to work there, right? Pets. So I, so I handed it to, um, <laughs> to Microsoft. I handed it to GE. And I handed it to Goldman Sachs. And I ended up in the next phase of interviews for each one of them. And, um, and for a variety of reasons, I definitely didn't want to work at GE or Goldman Sachs. Microsoft was interesting in part because um, they really tapped in on that that TA angle and kind mm -hmm. of understood my mission from the get-go and Got actually it. pitched the job uh, to me based on that mission. And, oh, and so see. that was like a big selling factor. Um, and then in the end, it was between Microsoft and my friend's startup in Providence. And, um, and my friend really was making a strong pitch to me. Uh, and I was, in I was intrigued. Um, but the reason that I decided not to go for his role was because even though the salaries would have been the same, actually, um, he wanted me to start before I graduated. He wanted me to I pull see. long, super long hours. And, uh, and, and it was in Providence, which I had been in for four years and I, I was ready to like move cities. Yeah. And so see, so yeah, you know, 
Microsoft was in Seattle. Um, they gave me a signing bonus so I could, you know, go to Europe for, with my friend <laughs> nice. uh, before I started, and they didn't need me to start until August. And so I was like, sure. I mean, given that Sold. I was, I mean, I was only thinking about this as like some, some kind of cash, yeah, yeah, and and not a career. I was not thinking about this at the start as the start of my career. I was thinking about this as basically like a, 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 a you know, a, a little bit of cash to pad my lifestyle. Got it. Yeah. All right. So w across this 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 long journey that we've gone on together, uh, <laughs> yeah. where, do you feel like you got really good career advice at any point along the way that you I've want to particularly <laughs> pass along? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, I think for me, my my mission and kind of recognizing what gives you energy and what actually gives you mm -hmm. life and purpose uh, has been the thing that that has made me excited to come to work. And, and did somebody, did, 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 is that just what you found within yourself or did, did you get that as like advice from some, like find your mission? Did, did, did you have a mentor that did that, that helped you with that or was that something no, you felt actually, like you discovered I mean, yourself? I or? think I did discover it myself and ironically like it probably was in the process of interviewing at Microsoft more so That's than anything else. So maybe the person I have to credit for that is Chris Dias, who hired me into uh, into Microsoft in the first place. Yes. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I found that and I and and I think it just only reinforced over time. And especially as you get into the years when, you know, you have I have two kids and mm -hmm. and, you know, it you crosses your mind about like, well, should I be spending more time with my kids? Should I be spending more time at, at work? And like, you know, it's yeah. you have to sometimes make decisions about like, am I motivated enough to trade off instead of to just, miss a couple hours with yeah. my kids to go to work on something? And I think if you don't have a sense of mission and purpose, I th I could imagine that would be really hard. I, I I don't know what it would look like for me if I didn't have that. Okay, my I don't know for you. Do you? Yeah, yeah, totally. I completely agree. And indeed, like one of the things I hear. So, like, I'm, I'm sure you like oh, I spend an awful lot of time interviewing yeah. people around yeah. here, right? Yeah. And and the thing that you, is like I I'm usually what we call the as app, the yeah. as appropriate person, the last right. person you usually talk to in a loop. And I I, I I'm now I'm going to go be motivated to do a better job at that part of the thing because I. Like, you know, I try to do what you said, right? Talk to the people about like sort of what we're doing here and to make yeah. sure that like they understand the mission and not just like, hey, this is a job. Uh, and, and and now I feel like super motivated to go do that more. Cause right. I'm like, wow, look at that 18 years <laughs> yeah. later or whatever, right? Yeah. That yeah. is amazing. What's your mission? I, I, I was like biting my tongue the whole time you're talking about developer yeah. tools to not yeah. take over the interview. Uh, but like, the same like, way, right? like, like it's 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 this thing about you know we we get to live and breathe them. We get to actually nowadays like even me and more of a dev role get to interact with customers mm -hmm. all the time. And now especially in new Microsoft, we yeah. get the opportunity to not just have that be capped at the people working on one operating system. That we have the ability to go and nail like talk to all of the every yeah. part of that story. Right and weave them together and connect the dots. Right, and like, right, right. Yeah, I don't know why you do yeah. it here. I always tell people in, in the said com part of the conversation that I was talking about with the interviews, I always tell people like, you know, if I ever get, you know, kicked out of this joint, like I will find another developer tools job. I know, that's what's kind of yeah. been so hard for me is like, I really am motivated by developers yeah. every day, right? And and I've had other other opportunities to work on areas that maybe consumers or IT pros are my audience, and I just I can't get quite as excited about it. Yeah. At least not yet. Maybe I will in the future. I mean, like one example of of a, of a way that I can kind of see it expanding is, you know, if I think about that that idea that like my mission and my my you know my joy comes from. Uh, bringing more developers and developers from more diverse backgrounds into the industry. Um, in some ways, programming languages, programming tools are not necessarily the, the gating factor yeah. for access, right? If we think about folks in, um, in Africa, let's say, yeah. uh, you know, it could be incredibly empowering to have more network access and more reliable network access. 
And that could actually play a much right. bigger impact on the, the you know, lives of, and makeup of the future yeah. of developers in the world than, you know, did I design the right fluent API right. or it's something It's funny how like it's that. almost like you're still like, what you're trying to do is in the, the funnel of, of trying to get yeah. these people developer tools, like well, what are the things in the way of it? Sometimes right. it will be other things. Right, exactly. And, and so and, like, yeah, yeah, I could see myself kind of going and working on things like that. Um, if I really start to believe that those are the true gating factors. Okay, this is a fantastic place to end. Okay. So I'm totally gonna end here. <laughs> okay, All right, cool. Amanda, thank you very much for thank your time. Thank you for inviting me, Steve. Yeah. It's been fun. Awesome.